Today I'll be joined by Devon Simmons, who's here on stage with me, and uh, by another panelist, Michelle Jones, who's going to come to us via Skype. So uh, she's listening to us right now, and she will be on the, the panel via Skype after I speak and then Devon speaks. We'll bring her up for her own presentation and then for the discussion at the end. So uh, this is a panel that is meant to talk about reentry and the kinds of work that we do uh, in concert with people who are coming home from prison. The term reentry has been a little contested in recent years because the truth is that once you've done time, you never stop reentering. So it's not like there's a period of reentry right after you come home, and a lot of folks are advocating for different language around that process right now. So I will refer mostly to folks who've come home from prison as formerly incarcerated people or folks who've come home from prison. Um, but we can each approach that language in our own ways as we try to have this conversation about what's happening with people as they re-enter the world outside, but also re-enter the physical space of the lives that a lot of us are living out here. Um, so as I said, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I'm a theater professor by training, but I run an interdisciplinary arts program that was founded by my predecessor, Buzz Alexander, in 1990. So Buzz Alexander was an English professor, and he was teaching a course through the English department at the U of M called Theater for Social Change. And he had a student come to him and say, could I do the theater workshop that I'm supposed to do for this class outside of the university in a women's prison? And he said, that sounds like an amazing idea. Can I go with you? And this particular student, a woman named Liz Boner, was going to the women's prison already on a regular basis because she had been assigned as a student proxy to a, currently to a student who was at that time incarcerated in the women's prison in Michigan. So the way that worked was that a student from the regular university campus would be matched with somebody who had gained admission to the university from inside the prison. And that student, each student on both sides of the walls would take all the same classes. So they would decide together what they thought would be fun to take this semester. And then the one who was on our regular campus would go to class and take all the notes and and the textbooks and the exams and so forth to the prison once a week and exchange things with the incarcerated student who would then send her work back to campus. So the woman who Liz Boner, Buzz Alexander's student, was paired with was at that time uh, called Mary Glover. Her name is now Mary Heinen. But Mary Glover is a historic figure in the history of Michigan prisons because she was the named lead plaintiff on 13 class action lawsuits for advocating for the rights of women in Michigan prisons. And she won all of them. And all of, those, all of the legislation, all of the policy put in place because of her ruling remains uncontested in the state of Michigan today. And now there are people around the country writing dissertations about the Glover case and how it changed the lives of women in Michigan prisons. So uh, I'm really proud to say that Mary Heinen, as she is now known, is on the staff at the Prison Creative Arts Project. She did 27 years in Michigan prisons. And at the time that she earned her college education from the U of M, she thought she was never coming home. She was doing life without parole. And uh, after her release, she came to work with us at the U of M and is now employed full time as a staff member with benefits and trains our students to get ready to go into the prisons. But I'm getting ahead of myself in the story of our history. So the Prison Creative Arts Project came out of this theater workshop that Liz Boner and Buzz Alexander and Mary Glover were all a part of in 1990. So uh, Buzz Alexander didn't know what he was doing going into prison to do arts work. And and one of the first games that he taught the women was a theater game called Vampire, where he asked everybody to close their eyes, put their hands out in front of them, and walk around the room until they bumped into somebody. And then when you bump into somebody, you're supposed to scream. That's the game. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, it's, we do silly things in the theater, and this is the kind of game that you might see in a university theater class as a way of opening up people's vulnerability, getting a sense of people moving in space, a kind of ensemble in the room. But in prison, this breaks like all the rules. <laughs> and nobody had given Buzz Alexander or Liz Boner any training about what you were and were not allowed to do in prison. So you're really not supposed to close your eyes in prison because you never know what's around the corner from you or what's coming at you. And um, Buzz closed his eyes 
eyes and started wandering around the room like this, and there was total silence. Nobody was bumping into each other and screaming the way the game's supposed to work. And so he opened his eyes, and half of the 60 women who'd been in the room had fled. The other half were mostly standing on the sidelines watching to see what was going to happen next, and there were two or three people who were actually playing the game and not running into anybody. Um, and so they sort of stumbled their way through their first th couple of theater workshops, and at the end of that first day, one of the women came to Buzz and said, will you come back? Will you keep coming to see us? And he said, yes, I'm very excited to come back. I'll come every week for the rest of the semester. And then she said, and can we please scream every week? Because screaming is also a thing that's forbidden in prison. Um, so I tell that anecdote about our origin story at PCAP as a way of saying that sometimes we don't even know what we've unlocked in people through the arts. And uh, the power of getting to do things that you don't ordinarily get to do is even stronger in prison than it is in many other free world contexts. So out of that one theater workshop, Buzz Alexander realized that his contact with the women in the prison and his students' contact with the women in the prison had changed him and taught him more than any other life experience he'd ever had in or out of a classroom. So he went back to the university and developed a pedagogy that we still use to this day that would enable students and incarcerated people to come together in meaningful community for what we call mutual learning and growth through the process of art making. So we are art makers. We do do all kinds of art. We do weekly workshops in theater, creative writing, visual art, music, and photography in prisons all over the state of Michigan. We work in all 28 Michigan Department of Corrections facilities. Um, but our art making is not nearly as important to us as the formation of community between people who live in prison and people who don't. So we're not a prison education program in the traditional sense because our students are not teachers. They're not going in with curriculum. They are facilitators who go into the prison to make these kinds of experiences happen. And those of us who are teachers are mostly on campus directing our students to go into the, into the prisons and do this work. So the, the weekly workshops are where we started, and they are the majority of the work we do in prisons. We now send about 80 students per week into Michigan adult and juvenile correctional facilities in order to do this kind of programming. We also work with people who've come home from prison doing these kinds of workshops and a host of other things that I'll tell you about in just a minute. Um, what we're best known for in the outside world, the world outside of prisons, is our annual exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners. We have one of the largest exhibitions of uh, prisoner art in the world, and it's displayed every year on our campus for two weeks in March and April. Last year, we exhibited 650 works of art by 550 artists. So it's a huge show in a very small gallery because we don't have a bigger place to be. We build extra walls in the middle of the gallery and we hang the show floor to ceiling and then have a bunch of bins and pylons that have sculptures on them all around the gallery to try to cram it all in. Um, it is a very interesting and diverse show, and one of the reasons why we've let it get so big, despite our inability to get a bigger space, is because it's one of the only legitimate ways that people in Michigan prisons can make money for something besides a regular prison job. So the Prison Creative Arts Project has a deal with the university, with um, the Michigan Department of Corrections that we are allowed to sell art on behalf of incarcerated artists, but only once a year, only at this exhibition, not online and not at any other time of year, and we can only make one payment per artist each year. So if we screw up our accounting and we owe somebody money, uh, or we've overpaid them, um, we wouldn't correct it if we overpaid them, but if we didn't, for whatever reason, pay somebody enough money, we have to wait a year to correct it. That's how strict the, the funding system is with the Michigan Department of Corrections. So uh, all of the proceeds from that show go directly back to the artists. If you have a painting and you want to sell it for $50, then $50 is going in your inmate account if the painting sells. The patron will pay more than that because we add taxes for the state and for what they call the inmate benefit fund. Um, that the pris It's a tax that the prison charges. Um, so the patron incurs that cost, but the artist gets whatever he or she asked for for their work of art if it sells. The other big annual project that we do is to publish a journal of creative writing by writers inside Michigan prisons. And every year we receive over 300 works of poetry, prose, and essays in the mail. 
and my husband, who's a lecturer in the English department, and a formerly incarcerated poet named Cozine Welch, are the editors of the Literary Journal, and they work together with a team of students, family members of incarcerated people, staff from around the campus, anybody who wants to come in and help can come read submissions. And they read these hundreds of pieces of writing that come to us, and they respond to every single one with feedback and critique. So nobody gets a form rejection letter for us from us, even though we can only publish about 7% of what comes to us um, through the mail for the, ex for the journal. So in the case of both the journal and the exhibition, we're a little unlike other kinds of prison programming, because a lot of prison arts programs will publish or exhibit absolutely anything that comes into their hands. And our work is really about creating a show and a journal that, uh, that people would appreciate whether or not they cared about prisons at all. We want the work to be so high quality that if you love art, you would love our show. Even if you have no attachment to prisons or you think prisons are a scary and terrible idea and you don't want to know anything about them. Um, and that's also true of the journal. So the work we do with those pieces of our, our community engagement are to both give feedback and support to all of the folks inside, all of the all of the artists who are exhibiting in the show get to meet with us personally. We send a team of curators in to talk to them, to critique their art, to give them feedback, whether or not it gets selected for the show. Everybody got to have a personal conversation, and we go once a year into all 28 facilities in the entire state of Michigan, including way up in the Upper Peninsula. For those of you who know Michigan geography, we tend to do it on our hand, so the Lower Peninsula looks like a hand, and then the Upper Peninsula is way up here. And to get all the way close to where we are now, in Wisconsin, you have to cross the one bridge that will take you into the Upper Peninsula and drive all the way across. So for most people who are in prison in the state of Michigan, they were taken from the city of Detroit, which is way down here. And in order for your family to get to visit you in the Upper Peninsula, they would have to drive all the way up to the top of the state and then across the peninsula to wherever godforsaken place we stuck that prison in, in order for your family to visit you. So especially in the cruel Michigan winters, most of the folks up here don't see anybody. And even in good weather, it's a really hard journey for families to make. So our curation team are sometimes the only people who lay eyes on some of these folks inside. And because we have this 28-year history with the Michigan Department of Corrections, in the last few years, they've actually let us see the folks in solitary confinement as well. Um, some of them they make us visit while they're in a cage, which is really, really unfortunate. But we still get to see them. We get to talk to them. We get to tell them what we think about their art and let them know that somebody out there has been waiting all year long to see them just the way that they've been waiting all year long to see us. So it is a process about art making, but it's also a process of being seen and of physically and ideologically and artistically encountering other people. Um, so I promised I would tell you about the programming that we have for people who come home from prison, which is really the focus of what we're doing today, but I felt that you needed all of that as background because our work for people who are out of prison is really meant to be a continuation of the community that we've built while people were in prison. So if you were seeing our students every week in workshop, if you were visiting with us once a year and corresponding with us throughout the year because you were in a prison too distant for us to do workshops, you may have a sense of us in the PCAP office, our faculty, our staff, our students, as people who were there for you and who supported you while you were in prison. Over 70% of people in prison get no visits from anybody at all the entire time that they're serving their sentence. So sometimes uh, if people's families have died or disappeared or gone away or um, forgotten about them deliberately, then we are some of the only people whose faces they might actually know when they're coming out. And we want to be those people in community of support when they actually make it to the other side of the walls. One of the hard things about doing work with people who've come home from prison is that they don't all conveniently go to the same place where you can show up and visit them together the way that, that it works when you're doing work inside the walls. So if we want to do a workshop for people in prison, we go to the prison and everybody's there because they live there. But when people come home from prison, you have issues of transportation, housing, employment, rebuilding of family and community relationships that may have been broken while you're gone. So the programming for people in the outside world is actually much, much harder logistically than the work that we do with people inside. So what we've been able to do is to basically throw open the doors of everything that we do at the University of Michigan for our students 
to anybody who wants to come from the outside world. So anybody is perfectly welcome to come and sit in on my classes anytime if they just want to be with the students and with me and talk about some of these issues that really matter to them. We also hold a, a long series of lectures and events on our campus throughout the year. And every chance that we're able, we try to pay formerly incarcerated people to hold roles of authority. So I've already told you about Mary Heinen, who's the staff person who trains all of our students to go to prison. Cozine Welch is the managing editor of our literary review. Both of those are paid positions. Cozine also co-teaches all of my PCAP classes with me this year, which I'm really excited about. Um, but we pay people for smaller jobs as well, so to help hang the exhibition, to help photograph the exhibition, to give talks. We're really good at connecting people with outside employers and resources who can can help them to use the artistic skills they may have cultivated with us in prison in the outside world. And that's really what our reentry programming is meant to do. It's meant to build a continuum of people feeling like they were a part of our lives and actively welcomed while they were inside, again, once they've come to the outside world. Um, and part of the work that we do is also about talking to people's families and making the families feel welcome in spaces like the University of Michigan, which have often been closed off to people who were formerly incarcerated. Um, my father spent 20 years in prison in Texas, and a lot of the work that I've done before I came to the University of Michigan was about connecting families with resources surrounding issues of incarceration. How do you maintain a family when there's a prison sitting in the middle of it? How do you explain when it's parents' day at school that your father can't come, but he's still alive, he's still a part of your life, he still cares about you, he just can't show up in that classroom today. So we've created a series of events as part of our programming at PCAP that helps families to feel like they have a place to come together. So we have a family day every year during the exhibition of Art by Michigan Prisoners, which is my favorite day of the entire PCAP year. We send invitations to the family members of everybody whose art is being displayed in the gallery and to all the folks who've been published in the literary journal. And in the morning, we have a panel of formerly incarcerated artists, people who might have submitted to the show for 20 years but never actually seen the gallery in person, come home, and then they're able to visit us and view the exhibition to walk through the space. I mean, imagine the magic of some of the folks who Nigel's worked with being able to actually walk through the gallery here. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, we get to do that with a handful of people every year. And so we asked them to speak about that experience, to talk about what it was like to make art in prison, and uh, to answer questions that people in the community may have about what that experience has been like. Then we serve lunch to everybody. We put out tables for children to make art of their own. We help them to connect with their family members' pieces of art in our gallery. And in the afternoon, we have a reading from the Literary Journal, from the Michigan Review of Prisoner Creative Writing. And the people who have come home from prison can read for themselves. And those who have not yet come home can send a representative from their friends or family to read on their behalf. And let me tell you, by the time somebody's mama has finished reading their poem to an audience full of people who care, when that person can't be in the room, there's not a dry eye in the crowd. We just pass boxes of Kleenex around for all of us to, to get through our blubbering as we make it through the day. Um, but one of the beautiful things about this event is that the families always say, there was no other place where I could go, where somebody cared about my family, where I could say, honestly and without people questioning it, how proud I am of my husband, my sister, my aunt, whoever it is that's in prison. We as, as family members don't get very many spaces in which to do that. And so art making gives us a way to show the outside world how valuable the people inside really are and how much their intellect and creativity and contributions matter to us. So I will, I will close there. There's a lot of other stuff going on in our programming. Oh, one more thing that I forgot to say about people who've come home from prison that I'm really excited about. Looking at Nigel reminded me, because we've started a podcast that was actually inspired by Ear Hustle. Some of our students and formerly incarcerated participants got together and are creating a podcast called While We Were Away. It's by and about formerly incarcerated folks, and hopefully we're trying to get permission to broadcast it inside the Michigan Department of Corrections to also give advice to people who are about to come home from prison. But each episode is an interview with a different person who's come home, and it starts with that person listing all of the things that happened while they were away. 
and, and then they talk about what it's been like to come out of prison and into a world that they didn't know anymore and how they've navigated that space. And it's a, a really, really beautiful collection of stories. And, um, and we have Nigel and Erlon to thank for inspiring our, our group to get started with that. So I really will stop there. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devon Simmons, and I'm from New York. Um, I'm, I'm a recent graduate from John Jay's College, from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. And I am actually the first graduate from their prison to college pipeline. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna start by showing a, a, sh a short documentary which I actually did about three years ago when I first was released in um, 2014 in regards to um, the importance of the arts inside of prisons and the collaboration that Tribeca Film Institute has with John Jay's Prison and College Pipeline. Okay. The correctional department is designed to correct you or rehabilitate you, but in all actuality, how are you gonna rehabilitate an 18 year old by giving them 18 years? I was arrested in May of 99. So from May of 99 until October 9th, 2014, I was incarcerated. I ended up being sentenced for an assault and they gave me 18 years. I never seen 18 years in the street, right? So to think where I would be 18 years later was really like, it wasn't believable. So it was no doubt in my mind that I was gonna get out before the end of my sentence. I fought, I fought hard, but I actually ended up doing the sentence. Everything with me was about maintaining my sanity. You know, that, that place is designed to make you go crazy. So early in my bed, I was fighting for, on my appeal, fighting for my freedoms. Don't nobody know doing case better than I do, so I had to learn the law. And that required time, energy, and it actually enhanced my vocabulary, you know, helped me be a better writer. Although they had me locked up physically, you know, they can't stop me mentally. Tonight's the night we're going to watch a documentary on the development of Nas. We like to remind individuals that this is a very unique experience. The Prison of College Pipeline and the Tribeca Film Institute, and they do the film screening. It's not like just going to a regular movie that they have in the auditorium for prisoners. And you're looking at it critically, so it's more like an event. And it does, in fact, bring upon hope and optimism because here it is, an opportunity to go outside the walls and to think outside the box. Why is it important for people's communities to tell their own story? Basically, so we can have a solution. If we can hear what the people are basically saying, we can understand. So if we have understanding, then we can create a solution. Guys are not in jail for this little while. Mm. It's like they're stepping out for a little while. There's a movement, and that's so important for people who have been isolated and stuck. Know that there's people in here that reinvented themselves, and they're ready to get up out of here, and we can prove that. We in the belly of the beast, right? With everybody saying, no, you can, and shunning us, and to have the opportunity to be mentally stimulated and to just be outside of prison while in prison, even though it's only for a couple hours, is a blessing. And words can't even describe how, how elating that feel, you know? I was fortunate to get out of there, right? I came home in October, and by February, I was in school, you know? So I didn't let that situation deter me, my focus and my goal. And I actually was in the process, am in the process of writing a screenplay with one of my colleagues, right, from the program, right, who's still on the other side, you know? Um, that's my, my right-hand man, Matthew Wilson. That's his name, get a shout out, right? I said, wow, here it is, I had the opportunity to tell a story, right, and a platform to do so. And I'm, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to do that, you know?
Yes, so I'm actually reflecting on, a, on that video because it's been a while now. And when I had, did that, I hadn't had one college degree. And now I stand before you with two college degrees and literally traveled all around the world. And I'm really excited to be here in Milwaukee in pursuit of helping to galvanize this community to contribute to the ways in which, you know, we can reform the criminal justice system, whether it's just through education or through the arts as well. So um, I'm just gonna give you um, a walkthrough of what the Prison to College Pipeline program looks like in John Jay College in New York and give you a little snippet of my journey while going through it. So the components of the Prison to College Pipeline program in New York State, the, the, the classes are held at Otisville Correctional Facility, which is in upstate New York, about two hours from New York City. And this is of importance. Ultimately, our goal is to get students to come on campus after they're once they're released from college. So it's not just about students getting um, associates or bachelor's degrees while they're inside. It's really important for our students to come home and to come to the college so that they can use the resources that are available through the university in order to reestablish themselves in society. So we do that by offering prerequisite courses while individuals are outside so they can accumulate credits. So by the time they get home, they can just flow right into school into whatever major they wanna pursue, whether it's philosophy, sociology, criminology. And one of the most powerful things for me were the learning exchanges that we have once a month where students from John Jay would act, actually travel to Otisville um, to engage in a lecture with the students that are inside. So that will take place once a month throughout the whole academic year. And it's really essential towards these people, our, our students' reentry because it allows them to create a community prior to them even being released. I can speak to that because I was inside and started the program and I was there for about two and a half years. And I remember my first time going to John Jay College you know, it was me and 13 students and we just mobbed down the hallway. So, you know, the fact that I had some, a, a group of individuals whom I can interact with before I even got home was really crucial to my successful reentry thus far. Um, we also have success in college and life workshops where um, our incarcerated students are actually interacting with staff members talking about the issues that they feel may plague them upon their release, such as reintegration with family, housing issues, and during those, those workshops, we try to create a reentry plan, planning process. Um, college Initiative, which is not technically part of John Jay's Prison and College Pipeline, College Initiative is a program which actually is based in New York City through um, John Jay's Prison Reentry Institute that actually helps individuals who've had impacts with the criminal justice system enroll into college. So College Initiative, say you were arrested and now you wanna to go to school. College Initiative will help you with that process, whether it be um, contacting your, your high school from 20 years ago to get the records to show that you actually completed your high school diploma. Um, College Initiative is a very interesting program to me because I've been all around the world and I haven't really seen anything that's quite close. And they also provide a mentorship program where individuals such as, like I'm a, I'm a College Initiative mentor myself, like, we actually mentor individuals who are coming home and are just getting into school and help them navigate that process. So the pipeline to the pipeline is how we just throw it out there. So the pre-university prep courses are basically courses which help individuals get ready for the standardized tests because just like any other student that is in um, John Jay or under the CUNY, which is the City University of New York umbrella, the individuals that's incarcerated must pass the reading, writing, and math assessment test. So they're not getting a free pass getting into the, to, um, the Prison to College Pipeline program. They pass all the necessary requirements under the City of New York, and um, that's essential to note because 
Those records, even if they're not selected, those records stay on file for 10 years. So even if an individual isn't selected to be a part of the program that year, their record still is on file, and when they come home, they can still come to College Initiative and get um, assistance with enrolling into school. We do statewide recruitment sessions through all the prisons in New York State now. So, um, you know, some prisons are eight hours away from New York City, but it's really important for us to try to reach as many people as possible because the majority of people locked up inside of New York State are residents from New York City. But um, we do not dis, dis um, we do allow individuals from Rochester, Buffalo, all around the state to be a part of the program as well. And lastly, which is of, of a lot of importance, is the partnership with Tribeca Film Institute. Because knowing that every individual is not going to be able to be a part of the Prison College Pipeline program, we had to implement something which would keep everybody in the prison involved. And Tribeca came in with the idea of coming in and showing screen um, their documentaries in which feature artists like Nas, or it could be about social justice issues. They actually, the directors or some of the actors or come into the prison, show the screen, um, um, show their screenplay or their documentary, and then afterwards we would gauge in um, intellectual dialogue in regards to the ways in which this film can um, help the people in the community. So we were building communities while inside of prison as well. So um, that's actually V Bravo, the individual who started the program inside, and that's Jane Rusty and um, Robert De Niro. Um, I got to meet them a few times and highlight the ways in which the program is implemented inside. And through my work, through the Prison College Pipeline and um, the Tribeca Film Institute, I got to meet um, a lot of actors and actresses in the industry that um, take interest in social justice issues. Um, and I just try to keep them engaged in the ways in which they can actually contribute their efforts into um, bettering the system for individuals who are coming out. Um, the success by the numbers, I, so we don't really like to use the data, but we understand the importance of um, the, the evidence-based practices. So the success by the numbers highlight that 95% of prison to college pipeline students who have come home are either employed or enrolled in school currently. 60% um, of them are actually in school. Now, the 12% of individuals who have actually been rearrested upon their release, that number is miscued in many ways because most of that is due to technical violations from parole, such as being outside past 9 o'clock, you know, and... Sadly, with all my accomplishments, I'm still on parole. Yes. So um, twice a year, we actually have an alumni dinner where individuals who are part of the Tribeca Film Institute and engaged in the program while inside, and prison to college pipeline students, and the learning exchange students, the faculty members, our families, we all come together collectively at John Jay for um, what well, usually is in December and June, which are the end of the academic year and during the holidays, just so that we can stay together as a community. And this is really important for our students whom are just coming home because it gives them an opportunity to network with people who have been home already and gives them some social capital. Um, we support all of our students in all of their endeavors. Um, so that lady right there is Dr. Baz Dreisinger, my mentor. She actually created the Prison to College Pipeline program. And um, she's author of the book, Incarceration Nations, which I feel as everyone in here should read once they get the opportunity. So that's the plug. Y'all should definitely read that book. But those two students there are P 2CP students. Um, that was last year's graduation. And this is actually the college initiative graduation. So we have the college initiative graduation every June, which is separate from the graduation in which our students would have at their own universities. This is only for individuals who are formerly incarcerated and actually receive degrees. So we acknowledge all our students by giving them a plaque 
to highlight their success. And College Initiative has been um, a nonprofit organization for over 15 years now. And actually, there have been over 400 graduates who have got there from associate's degrees, bachelor's, master's, and now we even have individuals who've obtained their PhD and their JDs. Um, we also support our learning exchange students and make sure that they know that the individuals whom are incarcerated are there to support them as well because we, de we develop partnerships and we created bonds in their family. So we, we make sure to go out and support them in their endeavors. So that's actually me at my first graduation. And this is me graduating in May from John Jay, summa cum laude, I got you. Summa cum laude, that's right, 3.9 GPA. And I actually, yes. So this pin actually represents the highest academic achievement award that you can receive at John Jay. And it's really important that I, I, I actually highlight this because just because I am formerly incarcerated or others that are formerly incarcerated, like we have intellectual stimulation to bring to campus. We could do policy analysis. We can interpret the literary text. So I think it's really important that that's thrown out there because this isn't given, this is no charity case. Like individuals who are incarcerated have some of the greatest minds in the world. And it's just sad that we're just letting all that talent sit inside and be wasted. So I've been able to use education as a means to travel all around the world. Um, this is actually my first time studying abroad in Cape Town, South Africa. That's Nelson Mandela's cell, and I got to bring my first degree inside Drakenstein Prison and show the individuals in there that the possibility for them to have access to higher education while they're incarcerated existed as well. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So that's inside Drakenstein Prison. And um, so that's actually my mentee. And it was really cool for me to go study abroad in South Africa. But then I just thought about how if I'm the only person to do it, then I'm just the exception to the rule. So with that, I told my mentee, I said, listen, next semester when you graduate, I want you to apply to go study abroad. And we're going to go study abroad in Cuba. And it was a lot of back course, a lot of stuff, go through a parole and all that. But ultimately, we made it happen. So now, here it is, we went from studying inside, being in the prison college pipeline, working out in the yard, to ultimately studying abroad in Havana, Cuba. You know, so that, that was a blessing. I've also had the privilege to go to England and help develop their prison to college pipeline. It's called Going Straight to University. Um, in this instance, that's Melvin. He's actually got the first bachelor's degree from the prison college pipeline. Um, we were keynote speakers at Newman University. And um, they have a partnership with HMP Birmingham where they implemented their program. So we're just shaping the shape and guide that. Um, that's us in London. Um, I actually, in April, I was in Jamaica. I went out there to help develop a prison to college pipeline program out there. Went to seven prisons in three days in pursuit of showing the data that these individuals are capable of having higher, um, access to higher education. Um, that's me back in England checking on, on the guys. And lastly, in, in um, July, July 18th to be exact, to commemorate Mandela's 100th birthday, we finally unlaunched the Prison to College Pipeline program that I had spoke about earlier. So now the Prison to College Pipeline program in South Africa actually exists. And the same way we did it there in South Africa is the same way we, do it, we could do it here in Milwaukee. So I hope that everyone here is inspired by my journey and can actually utilize their agency as a means to make this thing happen. Thank you. Well, we are going to hear via Skype from Michelle, if she's pulled up. Do you all know how to bring her up? There we are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself, Michelle? And My name is Michelle Cousins. I'm a second-year PhD candidate at New England University. I've been incarcerated for 20 years. And I want to and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we were doing in the in terms of 
art and education and pathways to taking that art and um, spreading it out amongst the world. So um, if we will start with the first slide. So Anastasia is my co-author, and I see that slide kind of leaked away real quick. Um, and there she is. She is my co-author, and she's still incarcerated in Madison Correctional Facility. Our, our, our backgrounds have always been artistic. I sing, she's a poet, I dance, she is a tattoo artist. We both paint, act, and of course we both write. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about the play that people wrote. I want you to also to understand that we were incarcerated in a facility that was artistically dense. Um, we had an active choir, we had an active theater department, we had music for improvisation groups. Um, we had various paintings and clothing projects that were going on that shifted and fluctuated for 20 years of my incarceration. In fact, um, one program that I was able to create myself was called Lifted Liturgical Dance, and it is the longest and continuous, uh, continuously in operation artistic program in the facility. I have, over the course of 20 years, worked with over 100 women teaching liturgical dance and performing in the facility. Um, next slide. So the Dutchess of Stringtown derived from our research on the history of the Indian women's prison, its founders, and the women and girls incarcerated there. So in researching Sarah Smith, who was the, uh, the female prison reformer um, of that facility, we discovered an article in which she took over and preached her own sermon at the Duchess of Stringtown's funeral. We discovered the Duchess' death coincided um, with the annexation of Stringtown, which was the area of vice, into the larger Indianapolis area. So our play suggests that the Duchess was murdered in order to facilitate annexation. Um, many could have benefited from her, her, her death, as we say, and we show in the play. And so the play takes place in February 1872. Um, next slide. This is a picture of uh, Street Time during that era. Next slide. So, the Duchess was a stickler, as the newspapers of the 19th century described her. She was a, a prostitute of ill lady. At the time of our story, she's on her sixth husband. She owns a massive hotel that takes over part of the uh, over half of the block. She has many women working under her employ. And so when we think about sex workers and we think about women with empowerment and we think about gender disparities and incarceration, this is the type of woman, this self-employed, empowering, taking care of her um, community, right? Women who have been labeled, ruined, stained. Tainted. She provided the means for these women to make money and survive. And so she, but she was the ultimate, the end, the, the ultimate, um, how should I say? She was the ultimate end of Sarah Smith and Quaker reformers. So let's talk a little bit about Sarah Smith. Let's use the next slide, please. So Sarah Smith was a Quaker reformer. She, her mission was to create and a safe place, a real safe environment for all women. So the Duchess is adding them to her goals and mission. Um, she often visited the Duchess. She denounced her at her funeral for the week for a meeting that she wanted to go to the She planned to open up the inner reform toys to for the women and girls to reform the fall. So this is the same facility in which I was incarcerated in. Her buddy, Will Coffin, is also a Quaker reformer, and she appointed Sarah Smith to the prison. Coffin and her husband are responsible for lobbying state legislators to pass a bill in record time to create the first facility. So what I want you to understand about this is that there was a motive for the Quaker reformers, these particular two women, to be in charge of a, a brand new facility and they really set up this idea that they need to get rid of the Duchess 
so they can get rid of those women who were working in India. And they wanted to put them in prison. They wanted to incarcerate. They imagined that the only way to help women who find themselves in brothels, who find themselves um, um, ruined by designing men, was to incarcerate them. Next slide. So we want to know how, how a healthy woman just dies right at the same moment that the town is being scrubbed clean for annexation. And so in our play, we suggest that there are several people who could have killed her. There's the governor who wanted the space. There is John Kitchen, her, her husband, who, her sick husband, who desired to be in her power, to be in her place. There's Sally, who wanted her husband. There's Sarah Smith, who had a motive because she wants to lock him up in prisons. There is other doctors who want access to bodies to experiment on for furthering the field of gynecology and obstetrics. And that is who Dr. Theodorus Parvin was. He is actually considered the father of gynecology, gynecology and obstetrics. And he is a mentee of Martin Sims. Martin Sims, who is the physician who used his own slaves to, um, to gain knowledge of female anatomy. So, at the end of slavery, if you think about this play taking place in 1972, it's the end of slavery, the end of the Civil War. What bodies, what free available bodies can we use now in order to, to conduct our experiments? And Dr. Parker was one of the men who realized that incarcerated bodies were were a great, or would be a great population in which to do those things, to do those experiments on. In fact, we have published journals in which she has uh, performed examinations, where she has performed surgeries that he published, that he published his findings on. So we begin to paint this picture that several people were in this desolate and removing the Duchess from power. So, uh, next slide, please. So, Anastasia and I have backgrounds in theater and Shakespeare. Anna and I went to play in the direct movements on weekends. Um, it took a total of 18 months. The Phoenix Theater had a grant to revitalize the art in Shaytown, and they loved our play. It needed expansion, um, and so we spent an additional six months writing the pre story to the actual funeral. And the director from the Paul University signed on to help. So we struggled to concentrate in writing this play with volleyball and basketball and radio and stuff. We kept up writing of the play even when I, when I was in solitary confinement and when she um, was transferred to another facility. So Anna and I are currently in the fifth edition of this play, which we hope will be fully produced in the near future. We have high hopes for this play because it examines sexual and gender violence. It examines the role of the sex worker in relationship to prison reformers and uh, geography and landscape and profit and economics in the city of Indianapolis. So, um, but in the meantime, the production straight has had retaining readings with higher actors in New York and Indiana, one station reading at Elm Hill Theater in New York, and a full adaptation, adaptation produced by the Big Theater in Indiana. Next slide, please. We also, um, can you go back? You skipped one. Right. We also produced a play inside the animal's prison itself. That, that is our team. We were allowed um, only one piece of cost costume, and people chose one item which they felt would depict their character. And this was performed for the National, the National Council of and they actually came in from the campus and, and downtown Indianapolis to see our production. Next slide. So this is um, a photo of the woman who played Duchess of Stringtown at our table read in Indianapolis. I mean, in New York. Um, next slide. And then we have additional slides here from the Indianapolis production of the full production of the Duchess of Shreetown. And um, I'm kind of um, what I'm seeing is that there's there's layers of slides underneath that are not playing and I'm kind of concerned about that. Um, but that's okay. Um, 
but I know some of this. And this is uh, some photos of the end of our, we can't see the other stuff, or we can go back. And this is an edition of Dr. Ian Downs Theater in New York, uh, with Anna Pierce Smith, that was produced by her Arts and Civic Dialogue series. Uh, next slide, please. And then we also produced a small table read of that also at New York Life Arts earlier this year. So that's the history of town. What's beautiful about it is it was an idea that was conceived inside of this room. But we, it wasn't confined to this room. People respected the artistry of, of, of the writers and the women producing the work to take it and treat it as, as it really is a work of art that can be viable in the outside world. And we have seen this potential, and I'm just very encouraged by, by that, and we'll like to see more of that in the future. Next slide. We also had the opportunity to participate in a libretto based on the life of Juan Castile. It was called The Body and State. And and this was the first opportunity for a professor, Eliza Brown, a music a composer and musician at Paul University, to work directly with incarcerated women in order to examine the life of Juan Castillo. She and um, go ahead and slide please. So as scholars in the history project. Our published writings and other writings were being used by faculty at DePaul University in order to, in order to teach classes about the carceral state on various levels involving women. And one of the professors was Eliza Brown. She was interested in taking our lived experience as women who have experienced object confinement and as experienced incarceration and to collaborate on the writing about the, about the body of the state. That basically is the last story of Juan Castillo. Um, she participated in the creation process with us and encouraged us to read and write broadly about um, about Juan Castillo. And all of our writings were published on the website of Sweden specifically for that purpose. So we read um, a book about Juan together. We wrote responses in the form of poems essays, freehand written ideas about the intersection between her life and ours. We synthesized elements from these texts into the librettos of scenes one and three. Scene two, she had been herself, and that pretty much made the same. Um, we retained, we retained, um, sorry, yeah. And we developed a group of vocal improvisation practices, using spoken and sung practice of the text. We were able to record these improvisations as well as dealing with all the noise of incarceration, uh, you know, air conditions, count time bells ringing, etc., etc., and that was allowed to be incorporated into the piece itself. Next slide, please. So these are very souls of one of the still. And um, she, again, she was sentenced to solitary And so the body of state is a three scene monodrama. Uh, one herself unexpectedly inherited the Castilian throne when her husband died in 1906. But she never truly ruled. Her father quickly declared her insane, claimed her power, and confined her to her house, where she remained and essentially for the rest of her life. So, Recent scholarship suggests that Juan uh, was an intellectual woman, uh, was an intelligent woman whose erratic behavior, whether calculated or involuntary, was a desperate and understandable response to her plight, as opposed to how she's been depicted historically as just a really crazy. So, um, next slide, please. So, what we were able to do is, is also ideas to the context of how this play the role. Roll out. So rather than serving as a pit orchestra, the instrumentalists who perform the piece are on stage with the singer, 
and involved in the production of the work as both theatrical and musical representation of the complex relationship and societal forces governing Rwanda's existence. So that's important because those that idea came forth out of our collaborative relationship with the fact with, with Eliza in the classroom, explaining about how imprisonment can compress you, how it can crush you down and, and eviscerate you, humiliate you. So um, in the next slide, what you'll see is you'll see the musicians on the stage. You'll see strange lighting. You'll see the pregnant woman leaning in on her. Because it's all about trying to show the confinement of space that we want to still experience. And that came directly out of our little experience of interacting with um, our faculty in the creation of this piece. Next slide, please. Please. So here you see Moana interacting with the collective. She is seeing him as one of the various people in her household who were paid to confine her. She's interacting with objects on stage. And so that, this is some of the ideas that are unique about it. Right, dealing with found objects, one of the things that we talk about in our class interaction is that often we need things that we don't have access to. And as incarcerated people, we often refashion and remake found objects in order to serve purposes. Of actually, serve necessary purposes. For example, I've written a paper about the importance of cardboard because cardboard serves so many purposes for us while incarcerated, from building our shoes from filling cracks and cracked windows, to leveling tables, to providing dividers in, in taking our drawers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I want to show you here the multi-levels of how that collaborative work was accomplished. So what is happening here? This, the, the, the faculty member is privileging our right to be knowers of our own experience. So I think orientation is the key. How does a person enter the classroom? Do you enter with the ideology that you're better than them? Are they inferior to you? Students are always already dealing with unequal power dynamics that that environment places on them before they even encounter a faculty member, a teacher, a supporter, a, a group leader. So teachers, the teacher-student dynamic has a tendency to be top down. However, any space for education is automatically co-created. For the student, is needed to make the space a teaching space, a space for learning. So, I just would like to encourage you as you move forward to, to work with the ideology of being a collaborator instead of a disseminator of wisdom from the pocket. All students are adults with a wealth of personal experiences that can be used to greater understand any topic and enrich any appropriate space. So um, again, in that space, working around the ground, we foster the community. Um, next slide. So, yes. So, since I've been out, I've been able to take those experiences that I had working with you know, the dance and the theater and the librettos and the operas and, and writing the play to also get involved with other projects. So I recently worked with Heartbeat Opera at the World Performing Arts Theater on Ludwig van Beethoven's Fidelio. And what it was, it was a rethinking of Fidelio for a Black Lives Matter era. The next slide, please. So what Ethan, the director, the artistic director of this, um, of this uh, piece, said, he said he wanted to show, with, show he wanted to show a political urgency. But the only features a wrongly incarcerated man, a corrupt leader, and a brave, amazing woman who stands up to the system and fights her way through it. So the director wanted to ensure that the update of policing and prison experiences was shown and accurate. So I was actually brought in to be a, a, a carceral expert in order to make sure that the costumes were right, the language of the script was right, the language was right, the things that they considered 
um, if it was necessary to create the partial environment work correct. And so that was an amazing opportunity for me to then take the experience of being incarcerated and tend to say that back. in many ways have been a negative. And to see how, again, my experience could be privileged in certain circumstances. Next slide, please. So Beethoven's story is of a brave woman who breaks into a prison to set her wrongfully conflicted husband free. And she is then recast as an African American woman, Leah, okay, who dreams, whose dreams she she becomes a prison guard to release her husband, which is a black lives matter activist. Next slide. And so you will see here there's the warden and there's the, the guard, the guard who's been keeping her husband in the dungeon. And the next slide is her locking, um, I'm sorry, the, the picture next to it. This is a picture of her locking up, um, um, her um, unlocking the gates for the men who are too long. So in the next slide, the core of Beethoven's opera is the prisoner's chorus. Um, and it is being captured via live audio, which is so cool about this. They went and got over 130 incarcerated men and women in choirs across the country. And they put their voices directly into the play. Um, in most cases, these guys and these ladies have learned to sing in German for the first time. So um, they were able to match that up. Everyone recorded on the same metronome track. And it was all synced together, and it was extremely powerful. However, some of the first original video renderings of this powerful moment didn't show the men and women's actual faces. The faces floating in and out of clouds. And I said, hello. If you're going to take the time to record the voice of incarcerated men and women, we need to see their faces. We need to see their faces sings up with their voices. Otherwise, there is a part where people who would not believe that men and women could sing in German and sing this well. And they made that change to the opera because I made sense and I asked for it. It made sense to them when I asked for it. Next slide. So there's several pictures there in terms of costume and things like that that I had to correct because they had an, uh, an, um, a view of um, addressing the officers more like police officers instead of correctional officers. And I was able to offer um, advice in that as well as in the confinement of, of uh, Black Lives activists who was kind of attention. Um, but it was an amazing experience. It was an unusual experience. But I think that it's where we can head where we begin to privilege the experience of incarcerated or incarcerated people, not just inside, not, not just inside a prison or just in terms of education, but also in this whole other larger genre of uh, arts, arts, of the arts. Uh, next slide. So to that, to that, okay, I, was, uh, I was able to participate um, in the Correction Accountability Project Capitalizing Justice. It was an art exhibition featuring the work of incarcerated artists, and I was um, brought on to help curate and find artists across the country. And there's a picture of my massage there, because that's the piece that she submitted for that event. And so, what we did with that event is that we were trying to highlight pieces of artwork that highlighted the influence of commercial interest in art and criminal music. And in order to end the exploitation that it being fostered. Um, last slide. So, in addition to this, these artistic projects, I personally support with my own funds the Liberation University Project out of Portland, Oregon, and the Freedom of England Project out of California, out of the Bay Area, California. Both of these are writing literacy, uh, um, writing literacy uh, movements. Um, one is led literacy literacy that I call incarcerated, current incarcerated people. It will be the literacy group that meets inside in order to um, engage in community building 
with incarcerated people. And I also work with Freedom Anywhere, which is a perfect spirituality and spiritual practices and emotional intelligence newsletter that is sent across the country um, to incarcerated people who whoever wants it. So lastly, I just want to say artists don't have the burden always of having the ambition to make a difference. But art can change that. And I've learned that from Biasco Gates, who's a very famous poet in the Mason of Chicago. And what he said is, art is a means to a broader end. And for those of us who are incarcerated and who are incarcerated, it means nothing short of a nothing short of a pathway to freedom for us. Um, so when you're thinking about the burden of that, and you're, and you're thinking about all the work that it takes to go in and create these programs, and all the barriers, all the blocks that the Department of Correction creates so that people would be disinterested in coming in, so they will have to do less work. I want you to remember the power that is, that is, that is inherent in, in keeping the formerly incarcerated and incarcerated people pathways to real freedom, real spiritual freedom, real mental and emotional freedom. That even while the body is still captive, you know, one of the people who he said when they had me inside, one of the things they would say about him, I would speak to them and say, well, they said, oh, you're not incarcerated at all. At all, are you? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But one of the reasons why I wasn't persuaded in the same way that others are is I had access to artistic avenues that have provided additional opportunities for me post incarceration that has actually allowed me to be able to get back inside to organizations that have been now supporting other incarcerated people. And it's just you know, the, the, the term artist used to be just what you could pay and draw and very narrow. But artists in the olden days, they were philosophers. They knew science, anatomy, they knew music, they knew poetry. They, the idea of an artist is so much more broad than how we look at it today. And I want you, um, as you throw, as you cast your net out on the work that you want to do in the world, Think about casting that net to include the incarcerated from incarcerated in a very in a in a deeper meaningful way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're delighted to hear from you and, and to see you, even if you might not be able to see all of us. Um, that was a great presentation from, from each of you. And I want to ask both Devon and Michelle to talk a little bit, um, as somebody who does prison arts work regularly, I often hear the critique, why are you doing education or arts work with people coming home from prison? Don't they need jobs? Don't they need housing? Don't they need all of these other things that other people frame in terms of, of practical needs as though the arts and education were not practical or needed? Uh, what do you say to those people when they ask why education and the arts are important for people on this side of the walls? Um, let's start with me. Um, education and art is always going to be important in the structure of our society. Um, I actually, when you talk about when people come home from prison, they need jobs. I actually got my first job at an academic institution. So, you know, the importance of education was always bestowed upon me from my parent. My mother lied for me to go to a good school because we came up in a poor school district. So I've always understood the value that um, I could gain social mobility through education. So that's why I think it's important for individuals to take social mobility in the arts as a means to navigate reentry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, and I would simply add to that that we are worthy of beauty. We are worthy of uh, uh, venues to be creative and expressive. We are worthy of bliss and, and color and sound. 
One of the one of the things that overwhelmed me a lot when I first came out of prison was the noise of of New York. <laughs> it can be overwhelming. Um, but all, but I noticed though I began to have, once I went to some jazz clubs and I got access to some live music and I was able to sit and listen to a, a woman playing the flute in, in, in uh, Washington Park. My soul was hungry for music, you know, other than what you get on the radio or what you can scrap together. Art is important for the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated because we are worthy of that beauty. That's all I'll say to you. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I have a friend who runs a prison theater company in a, in a prison near Melbourne, Australia, and the company is called Somebody's Daughter, which is my favorite name for a prison theater company ever because it reminds us that all of those women are somebody's daughter. And um, so Maud Clark, the woman who is one of the artistic directors of this company, gets really, really angry when people say that art making in prison is a form of therapy because she says, it's therapeutic for everybody. Everywhere you are, the arts are therapeutic. But in prison, or for the poor, or for the homeless, we call it therapy because they can't just have art for art's sake. So I, I heard my friend Maud when you were speaking, Michelle. <laughs> Absolutely, we are definitely do that. I wanted to ask you both as well about um, how you how you think about both your, your work in higher education and your work in the arts differently on one side of the walls versus the other. How does it feel? Is, does it feel completely the same to make art on both sides of the wall or to educate yourself in prison versus outside of prison? Or are those two qualitatively different experiences in terms of how you navigate your life, how you think and feel about it while it's happening? Well, for me, it's entirely different. Um... During my academic journey, I probably was doing more teaching than learning on the outside because I was constantly having to tell professors that the language they're using is inappropriate. I was constantly having to tell students the ways in which they're impacted by the criminal justice system as well. So it was more so me educating educators on ways to deal with people as people and learning inside, it was, I mean, we had our barriers, but we were, it, was, it was more engaging. And in regards to the arts, like prisons, is not, they're not designed to build self-efficacy, and it tries to strip you of your individuality so, and, and your identity. So, you know, to come home and be able, I actually learned more about the arts while home as a result of my experience with the David Rockefeller Fund. I was actually a 2017 David Rockefeller Fellow. And um, David Congratulations. Rockefeller, yes, David Rockefeller was really big in the arts. And actually, I'll be remiss, because I told Curtis when I had lunch with Curtis, I said I would have to give a quote from David Rockefeller. And he actually says, art is important because it expands how we look at and understand the world. It can make us think beyond our own experience, and often, in our appreciation, we find things that link us in the common humanity. And this is what the arts can do for, not people that's just formally called, but just as us as human beings. And in order to actually understand or get a, 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 a real perspective of another person, you actually have to feel them. Mm -hmm. Michelle, did you want to answer that question as well? Sure, absolutely. I think that inside we were challenged by limited resources. We were challenged by limited opportunities to um, work collectively and collaboratively. Um, we were limited by supplies. We certainly didn't have any internet access. So we depended on um, our faculty and um, postdocs to bring information into us, particularly for the history project. And sometimes we would wait months and months and months to get answers to research questions that we had that we had that were critically important to our community. So that has been extremely frustrating. Um, on the flip side of that, I'm, I, I'm my 
women who um, I did liturgical dance with for years and years and years and years. I um, I met them because I'm forbidden to speak to them. They are my sisters. They are, they, uh, ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> they were really critical to my ability to stand in that place and be free. And so being forced to live without them while I'm on parole is a violence. that I must figure out how to end for other women and men who have created real brotherhoods and sisterhoods and connections with people who are incarcerated. Um, huh, okay, on the flip side of that, um, access to art out here obviously is easier. Music, light, sound, color, I have a palette right there, you know, I have my, my easel, my art right there at my hand, easily accessible, the internet is accessible, um, my research is smoother, I actually got to go to the archives myself in Indiana and put on the white gloves and, and, and look through, you know, documents that were written in the late, 19, 19, um, late 19th century. So um, there, are, there are pluses and there are Your, your joy and your passion is overwhelming. It's a beautiful thing to behold. I, speaking of the archives, I'm really, really interested in the ways in which you both have confounded a lot of the stereotypes that people have about thinkers and art makers in prisons. Often people characterize formerly and currently incarcerated people as only being interested in the present moment, in the struggle right now, as completely sort of out of time and history because the, the dire circumstances and the urgency of our political moment demand so much of us. And yet, uh, you've both found ways to reach across international borders and historical contexts and draw people together in ways that folks never expected you to do. So um, what drew out the historian in you, Michelle? All these projects that you've described, most of them had to do with digging up historical figures in order to dramatize them or to sing about them. Where does that impetus come from? I think um, I'm a natural deconstructionist. I hmm. like to understand how things work. I'm curious about how, how my current condition was originally created. But in order to do that, I have to do a lot of excavation. I have to do a lot of digging in order to get to those original origin stories, if they're available, and then think through the red thread that runs as a continuous line through, through them. And if it's and no matter what the main topic is, I mean, I've done that for the cult of domesticity, I've done that for those such I've done that work um, when um, considering um, biographic mediation. Um, I'm interested in these origin stories. I'm interested in how we got where we are. And, and, and then, because it helps me understand that my experience is not a one-off and that it's actually part of structural formations of racism and, 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 and sexism and classism and globalization that prior to my access to this world, I really did think that I was going through something that was unique to the, 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 lady, the chicks on my block, me and the ladies on my block, right? As opposed to um, fundamental structural form, uh, formations of discrimination, legalized discrimination, stimulation, and criminalization that were, that were formulated, that had a plan, that they were deliberate, they were intentional, and sort of, and not happenstance. And I'm, I'm a natural deconstructionist, I wanna to get to those stories. And sometimes that means digging and finding parallels between the one of Castile <laughs> and myself today. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Devon, I'm really interested also in how you got to do a study abroad program or several while still on parole. This is a challenge that I've faced with some of my students at the University of Michigan. I've wanted to take them on the study abroad program that I lead to Brazil and the Michigan Department of uh, Probation and Parole has not been as receptive as somebody in New York must have been with you. So how does that work? Well, um, 
As one of my mentors once told me, academics is not all about learning. It's maybe even more important is the networks that you create in them settings. And I've been fortunate to meet some people in some positions. And the reality of it is most of the people who graduate from NYPD or the Department of Corrections graduate from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So for you to deny me the opportunity to study abroad with the institution who made you who you are, you're contradicting everything that you stand for in regards to criminal justice. So I've just utilized the platform of being a student and embraced it. And this is how I've been able to study abroad. I think that's fantastic and really, really smart. Well, and I, would, I would agree that that's, had, that's been my strategy as well in, in um, living in New York. Um, probably from the country and going to Mexico and going to uh, Hawaii, to the University of Hawaii. It, it was the same, same thing. I recently got, <laughs> I recently got uh, tagged or nominated or considered the parolee of the year. Sure. In my, in wow. My and I said, okay, well, if I'm the parolee of the year, yeah. surely I can go to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. I think parolee of the year should come with a free trip to Mexico, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and though it was challenging, uh, both trips were really down to the wire in terms of travel passes. Yes. I believe we could go across this country, blessedly, um, pretty much on the platform of a student and an activist. That's beautiful. So for people who don't know, what does that take? What is so, it? Yeah, it takes a whole lot. It takes a whole lot to travel. Like you have to go to parole, get a pass. They want to know where you sleep in. They want to know the flight number. And they want you to book all of this stuff before you have permission, which is silly, right? Like, why am I going to spend $2,000 on a flight and book a hotel room and all this stuff and you ain't give me permission? But yet, this is the stuff that we got to go through. And, you know, I've left the country several times now. And unfortunately, every time I come back, I have to go through immigration, like as if I'm not a citizen. Mm. Like, I'm born and raised here in the, in the U.S., and every time I come back, my, my passport got an X on it. Brand new passport, just bought, bought in 2016. And it, when I get into immigration, I see the ways in which they treat people in there, and it's really horrible. It's really a scary place. But I'm fortunate, because I know I'm saying, well, listen, if, if you ain't going to let me in, I'll get back on the plane. And, you know, <laughs> I, you know, but it's really disgusting the ways in which they treat people. And here it is, I'm a US citizen that's on parole, and you treat me the same way. Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm hogging the conversation, getting to ask all of these great questions to these amazing people. So are there folks in the audience who have questions or comments, things they want to talk about? We have some mics floating around to take your questions. Yes. There's a microphone coming to you if you'll just wait because I want to make sure Michelle can hear you. Hi, um, I stepped out for a second, so I apologize if this question was already asked, but I just was interested in how um, you both are keeping connections with people who are both uh, formerly incarcerated, you know, because of parole. Um, at least in the state of Illinois, people who come out aren't allowed to be with other people who come out. Um, and then how you keep connections with people inside. I mean, I know, yeah, that seems like that's a really important function for both, um, for folks on both sides of the wall and also to keep the sort of creative work going. Um, so as much as you can say publicly, if you could um, give us any tips, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, with the Constructing Our Future program, um, project, which is a re-entry project that was started by incarcerated women inside and that we are now implementing outside. I am board chair of Constructing Our Future, and so because of my position on the board, um, I have ex access to the women who are a part of the project through our executive director, and that's all official lines. Um, with the Duchess of Stringtown, my co-author is still incarcerated. I had to get official permission from the superintendent of the facility as well as my parole officer in order to communicate with her. So um, her name, her DOC number, her location is all in my, my file at parole. Um, 
in order to allow those relationships to happen. Now, the, the rest of my community, um, I communicate with family members um, because I do not want to put myself at risk in any kind of way for reincarceration. Um, because in the state of Indiana, someone's parole can be revoked if that person talks to the mother, family, relative, or someone that is in the facility of the incarcerated person. So there are two people who are in a relationship who have never spoken, but because they've spoken to the, one of the, mother, the mother of one of the other ones, she gets 90 days uh, in solitary confinement and she gets her parole revoked. So the stakes are extremely high. And so I do not talk directly. I do not uh, leave any kind of trace. I don't write send letters or cards or anything. And that's why I'm talking about this particular violence because I have created a true sister network without, with like eight to 10 powerful women who are ready to step out of this world and just go bananas and do so much good work. And I can't share anything with them. And that's a, a de that is a violence and a detriment not only to you, but to all of us, because in the outside world, we want to receive people who are well-networked, who have support, who have communities of people who love them, who feel strong and supported in the ties that they have to people coming home. So when we cut people off from sometimes the only folks that they've really known on a day-to-day -day basis for years at a time, we're doing something that's counterintuitive to public safety, it doesn't make any sense as much of our criminal justice policy doesn't make sense. Yeah, it definitely hurts. It, it, it hurts not being able to talk to our brothers and sisters behind the walls, but we do know that they behind us and support us in all our endeavors. And which is, I mean, I guess I'm gonna speak for Michelle as well. Like this is part of our healing mechanism for us to advocate on their behalf so that hopefully, you know, this system is dismantled and allow us to interact with our family members that's incarcerated. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I just think it's so important that we think, when we think about programming, um, we know that reentry programs that are most successful are reaching are programs that start with incarcerated people and continue mm -hmm. with them throughout throughout once they're formally incarcerated, right? So we need to think to build into those programs that you take into take into prison. Make sure you write it in the policy that the formerly incarcerated people who were once in will be able to stay in communication with the next batch of women or men that they're going to serve. Right, like they come out to work with these other groups. Without that written into your policy and your procedures, you will have a weird scenario wherein you, the you, the um, the practitioner, have to choose who you're going to cut off: the woman who just got out or the woman who's still in. And so, a lot of people haven't thought about that. But in terms of programming. And programming that's, continued to, that's designed to continue post-incarceration, you need to include that language in your proposal so that you're protected. Because you don't want to get gate locked because you still want to help Becky while Sally's still in. Right. And for, those, for people here who are running or are thinking about running programs for people coming home from prison, um, most states, if the correctional system recognizes your program as an official, officially designated program that does reentry work, will let people who are formerly incarcerated gather together, even if the rules of their parole prohibit it in other situations. So you're not supposed to ride in a car with somebody, or you're not supposed to be at a house with somebody who's also formerly incarcerated. But in our program, Formerly incarcerated people are allowed to come together at the University of Michigan or any place where we're doing a PCAP activity because we are an officially sanctioned program for people who've come home. So we are like a, a special and protected space where people are allowed to do things that they're not allowed to do if we're not there officially as a program, which is a little bit ridiculous because folks should be able to gather on their own, of course, but it mirrors the logic of the prison. A lot of the programming that we do inside is not so much for us to teach the arts, but to allow people to come together to make the art, because if somebody as a volunteer from the outside doesn't set foot in the prison, they don't let people inside gather together 
to do this kind of thing. Even if they are far more capable of running the program than anybody that we send in, somebody from the outside has to be there as the officially sanctioned volunteer. Absolutely, and in constructing our future, we employ formerly incarcerated women who were in the same facility as we. So we have to have that written in. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and that's really, really important. I'll give you a quick story in June. I went to H&P Pentonville and I was sharing with the brothers in, in London my academic journey and the possibility of them coming home from prison. And one of the guys in there raised their hand and they said, you know what, I want to thank you for coming to share your story. A few weeks ago I had a failed suicide attempt. But after hearing you and your journey, I'm going to go to university when I get home. Right, so, and this guy was a father, right? So it's just the little moments like that to instill hope and build self-efficacy in individuals that's incarcerated who are constantly being beat down. Like, that's big. And unfortunately, there's no data to demonstrate that. But, you know, that goes back to how the arts is so important the humanities. Absolutely. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Wait until the microphone reaches you, please, so that Michelle can hear you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, how do we get access to exposing the, the system here in Wisconsin, the Department of Corrections here? It's, um, you know, and the, the court system here, they've got people that are incarcerated and unable to be released. At the, t at the date that they were supposedly given a release date. Um, I have two sons incarcerated and, and we're struggling, you know, one of them is supposed to be released, um, a mandatory release date he was given. And now things have changed with the governor we have in, in uh, office now. They've um, decided to just hold on to these inmates that should have been released at a particular time and make them serve out the rest of the sentence. Um, also, I just read an article yesterday about a judge who can't get uh, public defenders to represent people who have gone to jail and are trying to go through a due process. So it's, it's quite a bit of, of problems here. And I don't know where to, where to get help, you know, but I just know I'm an artist myself and I try to express that in my work is, is really haunted me, you know, so I just don't know uh, to, in which direction to turn right at this point. Well, unfortunately, there never is just one direction to turn in. And I started my journey in this work, similarly to you, out of a place of abject frustration because the state was holding my father. I, I ended up writing an interview-based play about people who have family in prison because when he was denied parole for the third time, there was nothing legally that I could do. I mean, the one simple sort of crass answer to your question is that we have to vote on Tuesday, that these elections matter a lot, and that you really need to know, if you don't know yet, you need to do some serious research very quickly about who judges are. Who are the judges who are up for election in your state? They have a huge power to change the landscape of the criminal justice system around you. Um, but a lot of local elections have immense, a, a lot of local seats of power can do a lot. Your district attorney might or might not be elected depending on what county or what state you're in. But if you are electing a district attorney, pay very careful attention to that person. Because as somebody mentioned earlier today during another Q&A, prosecutors have enormous discretion about whether or not they want to, to lock people up and charge them with things. But the, the policy people will do what the policy people are going to do. I think we all as citizens have to take a certain responsibility for voting, but I am not one of the people, as Nigel said earlier today, who knows how to fix policy. What I know how to do is art making, and I believe fervently that we also have to make art. We also have to connect communities around cultural issues surrounding incarceration, because if we don't, then they can always just make another terrible law based on the same logic, or they can continue to enforce laws in a way that are really discriminatory, harmful, et cetera, et cetera, because we haven't changed the culture around how we think about 
about people in prison. And it's through connecting people in the outside world with people behind the walls and I think engaging in every kind of artistic project that we can imagine. And you've heard from a lot of different ways of doing that today um, that I, I believe that in the long run, these kinds of grassroots artistic movements have to be driving a larger cultural shift to help us change these things in the long run. But Devon and Michelle may have other and better ideas. No, I, I agree. Um, like the, the media images, so that's something that I, I, I've been dealing with um, personally. Like, how do we change the media images of black men in particular or black people? I mean, because, you know, if, 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 if you have a negative connotation of the way someone looks, you're already going to have a preconceived notion of what they're going to do. So how do we create positive images of people of color? And that's where the arts is so important because you can actually illustrate that. Yeah, I would, um, Devon, you, you bring up a great point. And um, as an artist, he's a photographer, he's amazing. His work is um, hitting that right out. His race, it's an analysis of race and stigma. And maybe you guys have heard of him. His name is Bayete Ross Smith. And what he does is he takes a photograph of himself in a hoodie, a sagging hoodie, that he takes the same photograph of himself in a polo shirt and a nice hat or a suit. And then what he's doing is he's pushing us, collective us, to examine our, our preconceived notions of, of, of stigma and of, of, of who who's right, who's wrong, who's a good person, who's not a good person, based on their outward appearance. And it's a really interesting work and some that's getting a lot of movement in, in, in conversations about race and stigma. Um, and I would also say that in addition to that, that we as individuals have to get real and examine our own biases, mm -hmm. our own prejudices, right? There are people who will walk down the street. You have a preconce you have a preconceived notion. You have a set of thoughts about that individual, and so when we we have that we have to do that work and examine the social consequences of race race discrimination discrimination or collateral consequences of the criminal convictions. We have to analyze our own how much we help the system churn by the way in which we look at one another. And so it's an individual process as well as legislative, as well as artistic, right? It's an individual thing that we have to check ourselves out. And just to show you the power of the arts, I told her I was going to shout out. A lady in here thought I was a district attorney. She seen me walking across the <laughs> She seen me walking across the museum and she thought I was a district attorney. She knew it. I just laughed, right? So it just goes to show you that we can change the way we perceive somebody, right? And this is art, right? Like the clothes that you wear is a piece of art. So, you know, all of that is incorporated and highlights the importance of the arts. Devon, if you want to be district attorney, I would totally vote for you. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. All right, I think we're over time. So I want to say thank you to everybody and uh, especially to Devon and Michelle. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Can I see her? Can you see them? Who's that? That's us dancing inside. And I miss them so much. But uh, thank you guys all. Thank you, Michelle. Hey.